So I'm Professor Simon Lewis, I'm at the Brain and Mind Centre, University of Sydney, and I mainly focus in Parkinson's disease and other dementias. So it's very exciting. Uh, the Lincoln Clinical Trials Initiative really looks at trying to get together the brightest and the best, so the basic scientists and the clinicians, all sitting down and coming up with a list of what are the drugs or treatments that we think might be effective for treating Parkinson's disease. And really what they're aiming to do is to slow cell death, whether we're using new molecules or repurposing old drugs. The Link Clinical Trials Initiative is a bit like being able to phone a friend 20 times. What we're talking about here is a group of individuals who sat down over the course of a few days and before that have gone through dossiers of drugs and said, look, this is the evidence supporting why we should trial this particular medication for this disease. And that's very, very important. It's a great sanity check. It also allows you to say, well, look, we're doing a trial in this drug, so please don't double up. Or if we are going to do it, let's do a very similar trial so we can at least share the data. And then finally what we get is the opportunity to say, look, if we can afford it, can we do some blood tests, look for biomarkers, something that might measure how active a disease is, because I think it's very important for us when we do a drug trial to get more out of the trial than saying, did the drug work or did it fail? Because if we have some kind of biomarker, you might know why did it fail? What's the better drug for us to try next time? And I think that's what we need to move into is to doing smart research. So currently, our treatments for Parkinson's are symptom relief. Basically everything we do with Parkinson's patients is to try and limit or alleviate the symptoms they have and they're effective for a certain period of time but as the disease progresses and more cells are dying in the brain really the, the, the inevitability is that people get worse either physically or non-physically, dementia, psychosis, all of these things that we see. So what we're really looking for is something that will stop or slow those cells from dying. And that's where our novel approaches really need to be focused. So the biggest problem we see in the Parkinson's patients is the losing of dopamine, a chemical transmitter in the brain. So pretty much all of our symptomatic treatments are targeting that dopamine pathway, either replacing dopamine with the precursor levodopa or stimulating receptors that the dopamine would, res uh, would actually act upon, the dopamine agonists, or some approach that would allow more dopamine to hang around for longer in the brain, either a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, so breaking down the dopamine in the um, brain itself, or in the gut, so a, a catecholomethyltransferase inhibitor that would allow more of the, the levodopa drug to get to the brain. Deep brain stimulation really is for those people with more advanced Parkinson's disease where their tablets aren't working throughout the day consistently. So they suffer the lows, if you were, when their tablets don't work and they feel switched off and can't move. And they get the highs where there's too much involuntary movement. So deep brain stimulation essentially places electrodes deep in the brain and then passes a small electrical current into the tissue, which disrupts the signaling of the brain and really, if you like, replaces the job of the dopamine transmitter to give a more level control of symptoms throughout the day. Deep brain stimulation has actually been in clinical practice now for 20, 25 years. Prior to deep brain stimulation, we were actually using a much more, if you like, unsophisticated technique where we would actually burn holes in the brain, damaging that cell irre irrevocably. But with deep brain stimulation, what you get the chance to do is to put an electrode in there and then change exactly where the contact is and how much of a current you're going to put through there. So it offers us that flexibility. And it's obviously very safe because it's been in practice for so long. Deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's really targets two groups of patients. Those who have uncontrolled tremor, that is to say the tablets don't help with the shakes. The other group who do well with deep brain stimulation are those patients who can't get a good level control of their dopamine during the day and they have dips down and too much movement at times, these dyskinetic movements. It's fair to say if you select the right patient, those patients who do respond to dopamine tablets, the chances of success are pretty good. As a ballpark, a rule of thumb, what we generally say to those patients is, look, imagine yourself at about 80% of your best, and that's how you'll be for most of the time. And I think that's a reasonable rule of thumb. People often ask, well, will it last forever, doc? And the answer is yes and no. The disease will continue to progress. Deep brain stimulation is not a cure for Parkinson's disease. Again, it's one of our treatments that limits the symptoms that patients experience. But the cells are still dying, so things like balance are going to get worse, memory are going to get worse, and the, the stimulation doesn't help with those things uh, as much as you would like. 
but in actual fact patients who have had the surgery done, who've had an, a, a good benefit from it, if you say to them, well look, you know, you really don't think this is working, you turn it off, they will really very quickly realize that the deep brain stimulation is still working, it's just not doing everything they would like it to do. In the Medical Journal of Australia, just coming out in honor of Parkinson's Awareness Week is a perspective article that I've written really targeting where we are with trying to find a cure for Parkinson's disease. And what it does is it says, well, how do we start to find a cure when we don't actually know the cause? And there are a couple of ways of looking at that. One is to say, well, we do see some, if you like, relationships. So one of the common ones that people want to be aware of is that smoking seems to reduce your risk of getting Parkinson's. Now this is not an advert to go out and start smoking because the risks of lung cancer are much higher. But there must be something about cigarette smoke that consistently comes through in all the trials. And similarly we're seeing things now where we can look at the epidemiology of people taking drugs. So for example, people who've taken uh, an inhaler uh, for say their asthma versus a beta blocker for their blood pressure. Now, the clinicians will know that those drugs essentially work on the same receptor in different ways, on that, that beta adrenergic receptor. And interestingly, the people on the inhalers have a lower risk of getting Parkinson's, the people on the beta blockers have a higher risk. And that begs the question, well, why should that be? And the answer has to come down to the molecular biology. So we're getting clues, if you like, from the basic science. And that then allows us to say, well, can we target therapies? And they kind of break into two domains. One, is there a new killer molecule? A bit like the idea of in, uh, in Parkinson's trying to take out the abnormal protein that you think might be killing the cell. And that's a reasonable approach, but whether it's going to be successful waits to be uh, proven. The idea of targeting that protein is something that people are looking at with that vaccination type approach. Maybe you can't accumulate it or some way of, if you like, um, passively immunizing somebody so you can break up the protein and stop it going from cell to cell. And this is where big pharma is going to help us. This is a, a new molecule approach, billions of dollars in resource and time. The other, if you like, streamlined approach is to say, well, hang on, if we know something about drugs and we just talked about beta blockers and whether beta agonists might be better, maybe we should trial drugs that we already have in humans to see whether they might benefit through, purpose, through, through if you like, act, actions that the drug may have that we didn't really know about. So for example, one of the trials that's running here in Australia right now looks at the data and says, well, we have drugs that remove iron from the blood of patients with thalassemia. Interestingly, at post-mortem, if you look at the dying cells in the brain, those cells have got too much iron in them. So you say, well, hang on, why don't we take those drugs from thalassemia and give them to patients with Parkinson's disease and see if we can slow down the progression. And of course, if we manage to find a drug that was already in humans, it should be a quicker time before we actually go from trial to clinics. And that would hopefully speed up the whole process for everybody.